All right, so I'm gonna go hit live here and minimize that. One time I went live and uh, I forgot to close the Facebook thing. And so I could hear like us with a 10 second delay. It was awful. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Automate to Dominate. Today, I am so excited to have author Rachel Richards with us, and she is going to talk about her second book, Passive Income Aggressive Retirement. Her first book was actually Money Baby. And uh, so, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us on your birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. It was actually a couple days ago, but we've been celebrating all weekend. So <laughs> you have to have a birthday week. That's how it goes. Absolutely. It's a whole week. <laughs> exactly. So um, we are going to, I'm going to try and pick your brain about as much as possible about passive income, aggressive retirement. So those of you guys look in, this is, uh, this is Rachel's new book. And I was so excited because this is literally what this podcast is all about. Um, all about trying to make multiple streams of passive income uh, and we use automation and, um, outsourcing, right? So it kind of, kind of goes hand in hand, but so you were 27 when you retired. Is that right? Yes. And I just turned 28. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. I didn't realize it was like, like only a year ago. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it was last year, it was August and that is when I quit my job and retired. Good for you. And so before that, what, what were you doing? I was a senior finance analyst at a global manufacturing corporation. I was doing that for a few years. It took me kind of a while to find my career path because, you know, the first few years after college, I graduated in 2013 and I felt like I was job hopping a little bit, didn't know what I was doing. So landing this corporate finance job was a real win for me. And walking away from that was actually really difficult. I had a great team. I was paid well. I was challenged. So it actually was hard to give up, but I, I wouldn't go back. I love uh, the freedom that I have now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know there was a, a just reading from your books, uh, there was a time you were a financial advisor in there too. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That was actually my first job out of college. Um, I had a sales Ooh, that's background. That's a tough gig right out of college. Yes. And I, I was like 20 when I graduated. So just picture like a 20 year old girl trying to tell all these old people how to invest their life savings. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of funny when you think about it, but I didn't realize it was such a salesy job. That's just because I was naive. You know, you really have to cold call and build that book of business for years and years before you get to spend most of your time actually helping people. And I was just too impatient to do that. I just want to help people with their money. Um, so that's why I, I think I was in that job for about a year. And then I decided, that it wasn't for me. Yeah, actually, we have a, a kind of similar story. So um, I, uh, I think I was 23 when I decided to become a financial advisor. And same thing. I was like, I'm going to help all these people. It's going to be awesome. And I had like no clue that it was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> however, I learned so much in that job that I was able to transfer into others. So it was a hugely awesome skill set. Yeah, um, I agree. It's so funny how in retrospect, all of the dots connect. Like if I didn't have that job, I wouldn't have been able to put on my first book. Oh, I'm a former financial advisor. You know, that gave me the level of credibility I needed to start my business. So it all worked out really well. Yeah. And I mean, just, just everything that you know about stocks and bonds and REITs and, you know, everything from, you know, did you have, you, did you have your seven, your, your six, which one? Did um, you series seven and 66. Okay. Yeah. So, um, that laid the foundation for you to be able to build the portfolio part, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Which is amazing. Um, so, okay. So before we dive into passive income, aggressive retirement, tell us just a little bit about the first book, Money Honey. Yeah. So I published and launched Money Honey in 2017. And at the time it was, this was after I was a financial advisor, but I had always been this go-to person throughout high school and college that all my family and friends came to for financial advice. And I started wondering, well, why aren't they reading or learning on their own like I did or, you know, whatever, self-educating. And then I remembered, oh yeah, personal finance is super boring and <laughs> awful and intimidating and complex. So I thought to myself, well, how can I make this topic fun and sassy and, you know, just humorous and simple? And that's where the idea of Money Honey came from. So I wrote it, um, very, very low expectations. I self-published and it has been more successful than I ever could have imagined. I think it's sold close to like 15,000 copies now and I have over 500 five-star reviews on Amazon. 
Wow. That, that is amazing. And for everybody listening, uh, Rachel did that with no advertising budget. That yes, was right. total organic, which is absolutely amazing and awesome. And we're actually, we're going to talk about that, the marketing part, um, cause I want to pick your brain, but, uh, so, okay. If I may, I'm going to give a 10,000 foot overview of our book here. Cause I just, just finished reading it. Oh, thank and- you then I would love to dive in and kind of pick your brain about some of the things in here. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. So I'm just going to go through here. So we have, um, is it eight, seven, eight major ways to, I think five, but now I can't remember either. Five. There's so, so yeah. Oh, okay. I I think I counted coin operators as two. So that's, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's 28 different passive income models in the book that I outline and teach how to start basically. Um, But then I categorize them into sort of five big sections, five big categories. Yeah. And so I think one of the coolest things about this book is you take things that people look at every day and then put dollar signs on them in, <laughs> in a fun, sassy way, yeah. right? which, is, uh, which is awesome. Right. Cause I was thinking, um, you know, I was, I was reading through about the part, um, you know, about a car wash. Right. And you're like, well, you know, they, you know, it take, you know, it takes a huge amount of capital to start, but if you could make $10,000 a month just off of that one thing, and then you're like, oh, right. All of a sudden dirty cars mean more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so I do have a question. So one of the, one of the ways that, um, you have in here is online courses, Mm -hmm. one of your passive income strategies. And you said on here that you were going to build a real estate one. Have you built that yet? Not yet, but I actually (sighs) did just launch my first online course about money management. So it is designed to go along with my first book, money, honey, you know, it's just, it's called get your financial shit together. So it's fun and sassy for all my female millennials. And so that's actually, that's what I just launched. I'm in the middle of it right now. I'm taking my beta uh, members through it, but I do hope to start launching by the end of the year, um, other different courses about passive income and real estate investing is one of them. So, so yeah. So (laughs) if I, I may be totally off on this, but I, I think your, your favorite one is real estate. Is that correct? Yeah. I always think of it as the Holy grail. I mean, there's just so much, so much more to it than just the passive cash flow. There's other benefits. And I think it's one of the ways that so many just average people can become extremely wealthy. And so you did something really, really cool. I love the 10 model, right. With the, with the mortgages and things like that. Um, explain to everybody just a little bit about what that's about. And cause I mean, it's intimidating. People are like, Oh my gosh, if I buy the wrong property, I'm going to go bankrupt and who wants tenants and blah, blah, blah. So. Yeah. So there's an example in the book, um, that takes you through like, here's how you can retire from real estate investing as an example. And here's how it makes more sense to do this than to work 40 years and save a bunch of money and try to save this nest egg so that you can retire at age 65. So I basically have this table that outlines, here's how you can like retire from real estate investing in the next 10 years, basically. And basically the whole idea is to buy a single family house every year for 10 years all on 15 year mortgages. So by year 10, you're done acquiring, you're making decent cash flow. But then by year 15, when you start paying off those mortgages, you're really, really making the big bucks. So that's just an example. It was actually my first goal when I was starting to think about early retirement, I was just going to do it that way. But then once I started investing in real estate, things just happened a lot more quickly and it only took me a few years to do. So it was pretty magical. Yeah. So you, you ended up buying a duplex, right? Instead of a single family home and that kind of really compounded things. How did that happen? So in 2017, my husband and I invested in our first rental property, which was, as you said, a duplex. And we we were open to buying multifamily, single family. It was just kind of whatever the numbers would work. And that deal we found on the MLS. Um, by this point, we both had lots of money saved up because neither of us graduated from college with debt. We both paid our way through school and we were pretty frugal with our money. So we both said, well, let's put $10,000 in, 
for 20 grand and this duplex was 100 grand. And now keep in mind, this is in Louisville, Kentucky. Prices were super, super low, okay? It's a really low cost of living area. So we had a $20,000 down payment. We bought that house. We immediately started cash flowing about $500 per month. That was in pure profit. And then I saw the dollar signs and I started to get really excited because up until then it was sort of abstract. It was more of a dream. But once we got that first property under our belts, I was like, wow, I see how this can work. And actually, I see how we can achieve our goals a lot sooner than 10 years. So that motivated us. We saved even more aggressively. We reinvested and we just kept acquiring properties throughout the next couple of years. So, um, yep, I had a question and just like that, it's gone because uh, <laughs> I had another thought. Um, sorry, I, I don't know if I told you this before, but um, I, I had a stroke a couple of years ago. And so, I saw, yeah. What, one of the things is I'll, I'll lose my train of thought. So you just have to go with me. Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> um, so I, I just, uh, after reading, reading the book, I left a review and the, and the way that I described it was it's kind of the rich dad, poor dad for this, this millennium. And, uh, I, I say that because he kind of, um, Robert Kiyosaki kind of just pivots the way that you think about things. And I feel like you did the exact same thing in this book. And he gave a lot of like really cool little stories, uh, you know, that just kind of like just went, oh, and you do the exact same thing. Like, for instance, um, when you're talking about Etsy, right, and um, and downloadables, um, guys, I'm going to jump all over the place today because today's a rough day. So um, if I forget... It's in the book. I swear it's in the book. (laughs) Um, Okay. So inside one of the sections is printables, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, print on demand. Uh, And well, there's print on demand and there's also like digital downloads. Okay. So explain that to us, please. Yeah, for sure. So print on demand, it's one of my favorite passive income streams. I I feel like I say that about all of them though. (laughs) They're all so great. Um, But it is one that I've personally done. You know, I haven't done all 28 in the book, but I did so much research and I interviewed subject matter experts for all the rest. But the print on demand is basically where you have, you put a design on a product because most of the time when you're selling physical products, you have to have a store or you have to have inventory. And that's a lot of risk because what if you buy a ton of inventory thinking it's going to sell and it doesn't, that's a financial risk, inventory risk that could be really bad. But with print on demand, it's brilliant because you literally put designs on products and you never touch them and they're made to order. So for example, you can go on one of these sites, you know, Redbubble, Teespring, Merch, and put all these designs on things like tote bags and mugs and sweatpants. And once a customer orders that item, then it gets made. So it gets made after the fact, and then you just get paid a royalty. So uh, we have this and we do mostly clothing items and it's, it can be very passive. I mean, obviously we could grow it into a larger revenue stream by putting in more time, but it's been sustaining itself, making a, a couple hundred bucks. I mean, it's not anything like life-changing, but we literally haven't touched it in a year. So it truly has been passive for us. And it's one of those that I also think anybody can get started doing immediately. And I think that was you just hit it. That was the pivot point for me, um, was that, you know, when you first look at it and you're like, eh, 300 bucks. Okay. Big deal. Right. And you're like, you know, why do I want to put all my time into this? But the cool part is, is like, it's very, very little startup. It just takes a lot of time, not necessarily money. And if you can start stacking, you know, $300 here, $150 here, you know, $400 here, all of a sudden it starts to make a big difference. And the time that you put in it, you know, um, it's not like, uh, it was a huge financial investment, right? It was a time investment. Right. And now it's going to continue to keep doing its thing forever. Yes. And I'm so glad you put it that way because passive income is all about stop stopping to trade your time for your money. And it's all about making money without putting in a ton of time. And that's the beauty of it. So yeah, 300 bucks doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're having to do hardly any work to keep making that, or maybe no work to keep making that, then that's, that's like a money tree. So I always talk about passive income in terms of being of two stages, because you can't just snap your fingers and create passive income. It, it does take time or money to create, as you said, and print on demand is one of those that it requires more time than it does money, which is why I think it's more accessible 
for people. But in terms of the two stages, there's stage one, which is where you're putting in the time, you're putting in the money, you're getting this passive income stream built and created or and launched. And then in phase two is when you have the momentum going and you can kind of sit back and be a little bit more hands off. That's when it really becomes passive. And that's when the magic happens. Yeah. And in the book, you talk, uh, you know, one of the examples is blogging, right? Um, and that's something that is super slow, super time consuming, but lasts forever, right? Because somebody will stumble across an article that you wrote three years ago, and maybe they stumble across your affiliate link. And now, you know, you receive income for something you did three years ago, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. <laughs> yes. And I'm so glad you brought up that example because if you, if somebody just would say that, you know, blogging is passive, all the bloggers would be like, it's not passive. You know, you have to constantly create and write content. And so that's, I always make the point in the book, like you have to make sure you are building this in a way that it can become passive. So I talk about two case studies for blogging, particularly Bobby Hoyt, um, and then a lawyer in India that had started a blog. And, you know, they both put in a ton of time up front and now they're really being able to be more hands off about it. So Bobby, as an example, makes like tens of thousands of dollars a month from his website and his blog, but he doesn't even do the work anymore because he's found a way to outsource everything. So that's the key is like, how can I delegate things or build this business in a way that, you know, if you do have to continue creating content, how can that be outsourced? Because you don't want to quit your job just to like then be, you know, full-time doing something else and have your hands tied. Or maybe you do if it's your passion. I mean, I'm pretty full-time with my business now, but the point of passive income is to free up your time. So just knowing ahead of time that you're going to build things towards that way, you know, outsource, that is really the goal. That's what you're after. Yeah. And that's, that's awesome because I, um, oh, geez. (laughs) You're going to take your time. I love using Bobby Hoyt as an example because he does so many different passive income streams. Oh, what do you do? Yes. No, yes. That's what I, that's where I was going with Bobby Hoyt um, and, and the multiple income streams. And it's funny how they like, they start to stack on yes. each other. Once you have one asset, you can kind of turn it into a different asset and then another asset and they can all become like money-making machines. Right. So yeah. like if you, if you take his example, the majority of his income is probably from his online courses, right? Is that- I think so. And then he, he, so he has his blog and his online courses and his membership, I believe. And I think he yeah. makes a lot of money from his membership as well. But, and for anyone that doesn't know, Bobby Hoyt is the millennial money man. Um, so I featured him in my book. He has an awesome blog and online courses and stuff, but yeah, I mean, it's amazing how somebody, you know, starts with one thing and you can expand it into all these different things so that you have multiple passive income sources. Yeah. And I'm in the process of doing the same thing. I just have to get the marketing part down. We're working on that. But uh, so I, I started by building an online course because uh, one of the uh, problems with the stroke is I can't write anymore. So I used to write all my blog posts. And then I was like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. So I ended up um, actually hiring a full-time VA just to do blog posts blog posts. So now there's four articles that come out every week with a targeted keyword that I don't write. And it's just churning and burning in the background. Well, um, then one of my buddies challenged me. He's like, well, why don't you write an ebook? I was like, I can't write. He's like, yeah, but you already have the videos done. And I was like, oh yeah. And so we had my writer take the videos and turn them all into ebooks. And oh, so that's now, brilliant. Yeah. So now we're, we're coming out with six eBooks and then we're going to take all six eBooks and combine it together and put it on Amazon for a print on demand book when they, you know, um, that's so perfect. And eBooks is like another example of passive royalty income. So that's so yeah, cool. So it's super awesome because you, I was able to not take the conventional way. So it's still me because I recorded the video. I'm still teaching what's like in my brain. It's just, I can't do a lot of it anymore. Um, and yet still turn it into probably, uh, four different, four different passive income streams, which is, which is amazing. Um, Yeah. That's the great, that's what I love about royalty income. And, 
um, selling content, I guess, is because people prefer it in different formats, you know, just because yeah. someone likes to read, you know, maybe they would rather have an audiobook though. So the, you can have an ebook, a paperback, an audiobook, an online course, a podcast, a blog. I mean, there's so many different things you can do if you feel like, oh, here's something I can teach somebody else. And then bam, you have seven income streams. Yeah. And like you said, you know, they all, they all may start out little, right. But don't discourage it. Like I got, uh, I got super excited. Cause, uh, I, it had for my blog posts, it had been like two years of writing and I like pretty much saw nothing. Right. And you're like, oh my gosh, this isn't working. Ah. Uh, and then all of a sudden I just randomly got a check for 150 bucks and I was like, okay, it's a start. And now it's consistently, um, you know, starting to, to, to bring in some revenue and it's yeah. stuff that happened years ago and people are just stumbling upon the articles that I did then. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. I think maybe one of the biggest mistakes people make when maybe really when starting any business is not giving it enough time, you know, giving up too early, especially with things like content creation and teaching people, you know, offering that service, you have to be so consistent for so long to start generating traffic and to start generating income. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's talk about the, the small coin operated machines. Cause this was cool for me. Cause you know, I, I was thinking about it and I was like, ah, yeah. Okay. A soda machine. And then you started breaking down the math and it didn't hit me until you put the return on investment numbers in front of my face. Cause I was like, eh, 300 bucks. And then you're like 58% return on investment. And I was like, oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Cause it's something so small that can generate a, a significant income stream compared to the amount you put in. I mean, it would take several to generate meaningful revenue, but basically the idea with a vending machine is you know, you put a vending machine in an office location, you're going to pay the, the owner of that location a, a percent of the revenue. Um, you have to go by once a week to restock and to collect the money, but that also can be outsourced if you trust somebody to do that. Otherwise, though, like one trip a week to me is pretty passive. You know, sometimes people are like, well, you still have to work to create this income. And, and it, I mean, yeah, there's no 100% passive income stream, maybe portfolio income. But to me, anything that's passive is, you know, a few hours a month, a couple hours a week. I mean, compare that to a 40 hour a week job. And to me, it's very passive. So yeah. I love the vending machine idea because you can buy, you know, a pretty good used vending machine for a couple thousand dollars, a few thousands of dollars. And if you get it in the right location and you get the right products in by, you know, doing market research, asking the employees of that location, then you can be making several hundred bucks per month. And for only, you know, a $4,000 investment, that's an amazing ROI. Yeah. And I think that was when the light bulb went off was when, when you actually turned it into the ROI number and I was like, oh, right. Yeah. Cause I'm only going to get eight to 10% on, you know, my mutual fund on a good year. Right. Um, so I was like, Hmm, well, okay. Maybe not a good year, but maybe an average year, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that was, that was super awesome. Um, yeah, Happy. some of the ROI, oh, sorry, some of the ROI on these passive income streams is so much higher. You know, for me, the point, a lot of the point of this is like, I want to make a higher ROI than I could in the stock market. And I want to have diversified income streams. You know, you have to have so much money in the stock market to generate meaningful revenue. And yes, that is passive income. But for a lot of people, like we don't just have $2 million set aside to invest and right. live off of that. So, you know, as another example of ROI, my first book, Money Honey, cost less than $600 to launch. And it's, I make, I think in February from both of my books combined, I made over $7,000 and nice. that's just in one month. So, I mean, the ROI on that, I don't even think I could calculate that. <laughs> right. Right. But, or but if you yeah, did, I mean, nobody would believe you. They're like, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So to, you know, just be aware that you can do this with little money. You have to be willing to put in the time and you have to be persistent, but it can really turn into a big money maker over time. I think you talk about MJ DeMarco in your book. And I think that was another book that like total light bulb book, right? Absolutely. Um, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. So what are the things that you learned from MJ that you implemented into your passive income streams? I think MJ's book, it's called a millionaire fast lane. I, it might be my top 
favorite nonfiction book. I just am such a fan of his. Um, I think it's just really helped me change my mindset from consumer to producer and start looking at the world differently. And, you know, anytime I'm using a product or buying something, it's like, wow, is there something I could do to improve upon this product or make this better? Or if I have a complaint about something, like I think one of the examples I put in the book was, you know how you wash your face at night and it just, all the water rolls down your arms. I mean, it drives me insane. And I was like, somebody needs to make an armband or something to fix that. Like there has to be a solution. So if somebody made that product, I would buy it. Um, I think once you can start looking at the world that way, you find it very easy to make money. Like I'm constantly coming up with ideas. I don't have time and I don't care to implement them, but there's so many ways you can look at the world and fill a market need, fix a problem for somebody and make money from it. Yeah. And I think that's the magic, right? Is when, when we figure out how do we serve, um, and, and really become a value to somebody else. And then the money just magically follows. Yes. And that's such a good point, Michelle, because it's, I would never advise somebody to, just do what they think the market wants or, you know, like for me, I love chocolate. Okay. <laughs> I could have written a whole book about chocolate and how much I love it, but who cares? Like how would that book help somebody? So I had to find a way to combine my passion with something that was really needed in the market. For example, with money, honey, there just aren't any fun, humorous finance books out there. There's to me, it felt like there was nothing accessible for a female millennial. So I wrote that book for any female millennial out there. And that's what you have to to do be thinking of why would somebody want to buy my product or service over the thousands of others that are already out there what am I going to do differently what is my unique value proposition and what problem am I solving yeah and that's that's such a huge golden nugget right there actually I was talking to Dave Chesson the other day and I love Dave I know he's amazing um and that's what he basically said he you know he went on and he and that's how he found his first big moneymaker was he was frustrated because he was trying to buy a book on Evernote for authors. And there really wasn't one. There were a bunch of generic books, right, mm -hmm. on Evernote. And so he went through and he started doing some keyword research and found that, you know, for I think he found like three specific niches inside of Evernote, right? And they just sold like hotcakes because it was so niche yes. that it was for that specific person. Almost like, I mean, that honestly, I had no idea who you were. I had never heard of you. I went to Amazon and I typed in passive income. And the reason that really good title, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> One of my readers thought of it, so I can't even take credit. <laughs> oh, see, there you go. She gets a royalty. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, I, but I was thinking, I was sitting here with the podcast and I was like, man, you know, who are some really awesome authors and, and people who have done this that I can get on the show. And so I went to Amazon and I, I typed in passive income to see, you know, what would pop up. And yours was one of the ones that popped up. And I was like, I need to read that book. <laughs> and uh, so, so then I sent you an email and I was like, eh, we'll just give it a shot. And you're like, yeah, sure. I was like, so wait. Oh my um, gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So it was, but, but uh, sorry, back to the Dave Chesson point. Um, it, you know, if you can, you know, the reason that, that money honey took off was because it wasn't just another generic financial book out there. You found a way to, you know, put the sassy into it and make it for, you know, the female millennial. I mean, it, it could be, but mostly female millennials. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, everybody loves that. And I love, one of the reasons I love reading your book is it's not boring. Right. Um, <laughs> Good. Cause I, thought, so, I was hoping to be the opposite of boring, <laughs> right? Uh, you did it. You did it well. Yay. Um, and I suppose that's probably one of the reasons why, you know, Dave Ramsey did well too, right? Because he took complicated, um, things and yeah. then just made fun of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's you so know? true. But I love what you said about Dave Chesson. That was such a great example because I think people, feel like they need to create a product for everybody. You know, yeah. they need, to, they, they want to have the most people possible be attracted to their product. But actually I think that hurts people. I think the more specific and targeted you get, the more your book is going to resonate. And I think Dave Cheston is a great example of doing that exactly right. Yeah. And, um, if you can, I guess I, I do not remember who said this, but, um, 
the quote is, uh, if you try to be everything for everyone, you end up being nothing to no one. Yeah. And oh, man, I, if somebody knows if somebody's listening to this, tell me who wrote that. Cause I say it all the time. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's so true. If you don't get super targeted and really try to dive in and help that one person, um, you know, then you become nothing to no one. You become a mm-hmm. loud voice. So, yeah, exactly. um, I'm sorry, it is 3.05 and I want to be super respectful of your time. Oh, you're um, good. I have more time, so it's it's up to you. Okay, awesome. May I ask two more questions and I promise I'll let you go. Yeah, of course. All right. So when you started diving into marketing, how did you finally um, pivot and the light bulb came off and you're like, oh, okay, this is what I need to do to let the world know this is how I can help them? Yeah, that's such a good question. Marketing is so challenging, I think, because I think people feel awkward promoting themselves. And I just try not, this is going to sound weird, but I try not to promote myself because people don't want to see that and they get sick of it. So instead, I just try to add value. And if they're getting value from me for free, they're going to be willing to pay more money to get even higher levels of value. So that's how I've always approached it. And I think it's great to do that in any relationship you're building, a relationship with a potential customer or a new networking contact or a business partnership, anything, you know, seek to give value first before you ask for anything in return. So that's what I do. Um, But in in terms of launching my book specifically, Money Honey, because that's where most of the marketing efforts have been needed for myself. And I was not a marketing major. I know nothing about marketing. I mean, I've learned now, but I started out just being like, well, how does somebody successfully market and launch a book? Um, One of the resources, which is sitting on your desk there, I see is the book published by Chandler Bolt. I talk about Chandler Bolt everywhere because I credit him for being the reason I wrote Money Honey. Um, You know, I think I read somewhere recently that something like 82 or 84 percent of Americans want to publish a book. Like it's a really common dream and goal for a lot of people. And I always felt I had that desire, but I didn't know how to make it a reality. And once I read that book published uh, by Chandler Bolt, I finally had the outline that I needed and I finally knew exactly what I needed to do. I mean, he gives you, you know, he gave me like 99% of what I needed to know, how to come up with a good book idea, how to outline, market, launch, everything. So once I read, I started putting pen to paper and I literally just followed exactly what he he teaches in his book. Um, You know, part of it is coming up with a launch team, which is a group of people that are really committed to helping you, you know, they're going to buy your book, they're going to review your book, they're going to share it on their social media. That's the most important part because you have to have a lot of momentum in the beginning so that you can maintain that momentum long term. Now, the thing is, I didn't actually have a formal launch team for Money Honey. I didn't have some group or, you know, special application like some people do. Um, But I was actually really engaged in a couple different Facebook groups. And they weren't even necessarily about money. Actually, one of the Facebook groups I was in was about politics, but it was almost all female millennials. And every now and then somebody would have some random finance question and I would jump in and I would say, hey, former financial advisor here, you know, here's what I think. And I would take the time to write out a really detailed, helpful response. And people really appreciated that. And after doing that enough times, people in that group, if somebody asked a question, people would tag me and they'd be like, oh, you need to ask Rachel Richards. Or they'd be like, oh yeah, Rachel is your girl. She'll help you. And so I kind of became known over time as being this finance guru or this finance expert for this group. So it was great. And then once I had the book idea, I went in there and I was like, hey, guys, I'm thinking about this. Like, what do you guys think? And there was such an overwhelming response. People were like, oh, my gosh, yes, you have to write this book. Like, you make money management so easy to understand. Like, I want to read this book. Please write it. So that obviously was very encouraging to hear. Um, But I kept that group engaged and involved. They helped me pick my cover. They helped me pick my title. So by the time I launched, I had hundreds of people that were emotionally invested in the success of my book and wanted to see it do well. So looking back on it, it was almost like I had an informal launch group within that Facebook group that, you know, that wasn't even mine. And it really helps my book um, have a great start. That's awesome. Um, So last question, you say in, uh, in the book, it took you a while to find your first property because you were looking for 
you know, that specific thing and you didn't just run out and buy the first thing that you saw. What, what were those, what were those parameters? What were you looking for? Yes. So real estate investing is something I always say, patience is key. You have to have patience. Do not settle for something less than what you want. Um, because that when you do, when you settle for a property, that's not quite what you want, but it's almost there. That's when people lose money or, you know, they get a much lower ROI than they thought, or they regret their decision. And that's not what you want to do. Um, so I think my husband and I searched for our first property for about nine months and it wasn't just looking online. It was actively going to houses, apartment buildings. Um, it was putting offers in and getting rejected. It was even having contracts fall through, inspections go bad, and then having to back out. So, I mean, it was a lot of effort in those nine months. It would have been very easy for us to get discouraged, and we probably were at some point, but we just kept going. We stayed persistent, and we found that duplex, and I knew right away because I, by then I had run numbers on so many properties. So, when I saw that deal, I was like, we have to put an offer in, and we have to do it right away, and it ended up being one of the best deals we ever did. So the patience, you know, was the best thing for us. I remember that one house before that we put an offer in and the contract fell through. I'm so glad the contract fell through because if we had bought that, we wouldn't have had enough money to buy this other duplex that ended up being so great. And the mm -hmm. other duplex that we bought was such a better deal than the original. So it really worked out. Some of the parameters that we think about when we're looking for a rental property, there's really two minimum requirements that I have. So first is the amount of cash flow. I always wanted to make at least two or 300 bucks per unit. So if it's a single family, two or 300 bucks. And then once you, once you get into multifamilies, maybe a little bit less than that, you know, maybe like 400 bucks for a duplex, something like that. So mm -hmm. I had these cash flow numbers in mind. It was based on kind of my own math and where I wanted to be in terms of cash flow after 10 properties. So those requirements can be different for anybody. The second requirement I had was the cash on cash return on investment. So cash on cash ROI. And I figured, okay, well, I can make eight to 10% in the stock market market over time. So if I'm going to make eight or 10% from this rental property, like, why would I want to do that? Because it's more work, it's more time, you know, I would just stick my money in the stock market. So my requirement was, okay, I want to make at least a 12% cash on cash ROI. And anything more than that would be a bonus. So that's how I went into every deal. Now, other people look at other things like capitalization rate and all these other like fancy metrics and terms, but I just wanted to keep things simple for myself. So I looked at those two things. And with that first duplex we bought, we were killing it because we were making over $500 per month in cash flow right away. And the ROI was something like 20% or something like that. So oh, nice. Yeah. So it, it's worked out very well for us. So any uh, tenant horror stories yet? Oh, for sh I mean, hundreds of them. <laughs> yes, I, I'm glad you asked because, you know, real estate investing isn't just this rosy thing. I mean, the biggest complaint I think landlords have is dealing with tenants and those tenant nightmares and getting calls at 2 a.m. like with emergencies. And that's no fun. And I always say, if you want your rental property investing to be passive, you need to build in from the beginning the cost of hiring a property manager. Because I don't think any of us want to quit our jobs to become full-time landlords. At least I right. didn't. Right. So, you know, make sure you have somebody in place to help you. But um yeah, one of, let's see, I, there's so many stories I could choose. Um, we, I mean, we've had tenants that we've discovered drug use in their room and we've had to evict tenants and, you know, we've had tenants like destroy places after yeah. they left because they were angry with us. Um, one thing that happened, which actually isn't tenant related, but it's just a huge mistake I made when I was investing. So it's kind of a funny story <laughs> is, um, we invested in this big duplex. It wasn't the other one I was talking about, but a different one. And it was something that we were going to fully renovate basically. So when we first bought it, it was vacant. We had all these appliances delivered, you know, brand new appliances, probably 10 or $15,000 worth. We had contractors that were starting work. And this was like two days after closing, we were like, getting ready to go with it. So I think um, one morning, maybe this was three days after closing or something like that, I get a call from my contractor and he's like, hey, I have bad news. And I was like, what happened? And he said, the house got broken into and there's some damage and it, there's some robbery. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, are the appliances still there? And he said, yeah, they're still there. And I was like, wow. Oh. 
Wow. You got I mean, lucky. God, so lucky. And in retrospect, I'm like, how dumb were we? Some of these mistakes are so silly, but real estate investing is just always a learning process. We're always learning and making things better. Um, but hopefully someone out there listening can learn from my mistake because the moral of the story is to protect your physical assets. You know, get your security system in place the day you close, get your alarm system in place the day you close ironically we had a security system that we were about to install and the people that came and robbed us stole that too so oh geez yeah so they stole the security system I think it was just teenagers and they took what they could carry you know so they took the microwaves and the lockbox and the security system just the little things it was like a thousand dollars in damage which was fine because we we really could have been a lot worse off so we made it out of that pretty good all things (laughs) all things considered considered yes (laughs) Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. How can people find you online? So you can find me if anyone likes funny money memes, I post a lot of them. So if you just search money, honey, Rachel, I'm on Facebook and Instagram. Um, But I'd love to offer your listeners, Michelle, my free passive income bonus gift. I talk about it in my book, but I'd love to just go ahead and offer that. So it's just a starter kit that tells you, hey, here's the type of passive income stream you, you should pursue first. Here are the deadly mistakes to avoid. And then there's a ton of free resources and tools. So if anyone wants to download that, you can go to moneyhoneyrachel.com slash bonus. And guys, the book is on Amazon. uh, So definitely go pick up a copy. It is worth its weight in gold. Uh, I would have easily paid three times the amount for this book. Um, Just amazing book. I can't, can't say enough guys. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I will let you get back to your birthday week (laughs) and, uh, really, really appreciate it. And everybody hit up Rachel on Facebook and just pound her with happy birthday. Mimi's Mimi's how do you, Oh, (laughs) my friend, Wendy's going to kill me. She's going to be like, I can't believe you butchered that again. (laughs) I love it. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's been so fun talking to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Bye.